Hello, everyone. Please take a seat. Um, it has been an emotional day and a historic one. Um, so we're just coming after a vote um, that, that changes uh, this European uh, Parliament, the Europe itself. Um, and we are now ready to talk about the future because this is the only thing we can actually do. Um, so I want to welcome you to this event. It's actually also the first of, um, of STOA Science and Technology Panel uh, for the 2020. And um, we are a bit uh, emotional today, but I think uh, talking about uh, the best things that are yet to come uh, could change that. And uh, I want to uh, welcome you all, a very warm welcome, uh, joining us. And I invite you also to share thoughts and impressions on Twitter during this discussion, because it's going to be actually less speaking, but more like discussing with each other uh, to, to see how we can get it right this time. Um, our task is to provide us to, uh, in the European Parliament information for new and emerging science and technologies and the impact, and the members will have the options to make the best possible decision for the European citizens. It's been 30 years of operation of this committee, and it has related the research with the future of transport, agriculture, energy, uh, smart resources, robotics, nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, and, of course, uh, creating an ecosystem of scientists and stakeholders that are exceptional and they are forming the future of, of Europe. So I would like uh, to extend my thanks to um, Vice President Vestager, Executive Vice President of the European Commission for a Europe Fit for the Digital Age, for accepting our invitation. It's a great honour to be um, with you, next to you. Um, an exceptional uh, politician, um, a very strong woman that managed to have global influence and impact on the future of actually the world in a digital era. So um, the workshop will be structured the way she wants it. It's going to be a conversation uh, with her, uh, mainly members of the European Parliament, but also a fireside chat with Anthony Gauch and Andrea Renda to discuss um, about uh, all the digital um, challenges. And I'm personally very interested and excited about that because I feel that um, globalization brought big challenges, uh, but also it led to protectionism. And we saw the result actually to the previous vote we had. And then suddenly we have the resistance of people with new technologies like blockchain decentralizing uh, the control that the big institutions had. So I would say since the digital era has a contradiction and a paradox that it has no borders, we definitely have to set some rules in order, I would say, to, um, by principle, to achieve reciprocity, protect our democracy, and at the same time have digital sovereignty without protectionism, being open to innovation. It's not a very easy task, and the matrix is not easy, as you very well said. So um, I would say that we have to at least do what we managed to do right until now, protect privacy and respect the individual rights. So maybe privacy by default would be in a third wave that will come with the next law, but this is, remains to be seen. So thank you for um, your leadership. It's something that is actually rare in Europe. And uh, you have uh, the experience that is needed as a minister, um, uh, president of the Parliament of Denmark, and already with the experience of how to fight global fights for good. So um, I want to thank you and move very fast to open this discussion because we have societal, economic, legal and ethical challenges, and I think we can set some light there. So I will please give you the floor for like some initial remarks, and thank you again for being with us. Well, you are you are too kind, uh, definitely. But but I think that's what a day like this one uh, will do to you, because it was indeed uh, solemn and touching and historic uh, to see the votes uh, just now, and uh, and no AI can change that. Uh, also, no AI can 
turn back time and we should have started half an hour ago. Um, so unfortunately, I will have to, to leave you uh, just uh, just past seven. So I'll make my first intervention short and then hopefully to, to take your questions because these are difficult matters. And if we do not discuss them, we will not get it right. There's no ivory thinking, master thinking that can do this because the promise of uh, artificial intelligence is that we have a new tool to fulfill our dreams of health for everyone, also people suffering from diseases that no one have hardly heard of, of unpolluted cities because we're getting control of traffic, of really fighting climate change because we know how to use our resources and we can make circular economy uh, come true. The thing is that in order to to be able to do this, we need to trust the technology. And as we speak, trust is falling, it's diminishing. Not because of AI as such, I don't think so, but because of, you know, pictures being shared that shouldn't be shared and uh, threats and weird mails and all kind of scary stuff that happens out there. And in order to build trust, we need to discuss and we need for people to see that when things are risky, there we are for them. So we will have this double approach of uh, what you could call an ecosystem of trust and an ecosystem of excellence. And uh, an ecosystem of excellence, you build by having funds and using funds in a focused way in order to uh, create the best possible research, development, uh, deployment opportunities, but also to attract talent and make it a thing that you would want to do also just noting, we have a huge gender gap in who uh, occupies themselves with de developing this kind of technology. On, uh, on the trust side, well, AI is, as you know, everything. It's in our phones already, uh, helping us with translation, uh, with voice control, with playlists. And even if my musical streaming service gives me a playlist I don't like, I'd find another one. It's low risk. But if the artificial intelligence helping the doctor doesn't find my malign cancer, then we have a completely different issue. So when we have technology that is basically life or death, of course, we'll have to be much more heavy handed to make sure that it can be trusted in terms of transparency, explainability, uh, quality in terms of the data that has built it, just to give you a few of the things that you would really want to know before you start to use uh, this kind of technology. And then there will be a third dimension which has to do with technology that is sensitive. That could be technology that uses our faces, our eyes, our voice, our gait, our bodily movements uh, to identify us. Uh, and the reason why it's sensitive is, of course, that it risks undermining fundamental values like the right to assemble in public space, the right to show what you think, to manifest with other people what you think. And here it is very important as an open, free society to make sure that we all know what we do and to agree upon it. And this is why I'm very happy with this initiative. Uh, I'm very happy that we are more people here and that you are coming here at such a full uh, room because it's definitely a, a debate for everyone. And with the yeah. white paper followed by a data strategy that we will launch on the 19th of February, we just start uh, the, the movement, uh, the debate. So there will be plenty of, of, uh, of times to come back. Thank you. Well, that was short and effective, and I think we already have questions. So I would like to ask my colleagues to, um, to start, um, and who would come first? Okay, so uh, I will start with uh, Petra, Tiemo, and Christophe, and then I will also give you... I will take five questions, and then if you don't mind a second. Okay. So you could, okay. 
Uh, Mia Petra, please, we could start with you. Thank you, Eva, and then no, a pity day to, to get it short, so I go immediately to the question. Uh, we are waiting for the white paper to come, but then also, if it's, there is a lot of talk about the, the AI. Is there going to be some regulation? Do you plan to have something? And I think some companies were afraid that the EU will uh, regulate, because normally if the companies are afraid of regulation, it doesn't go well. So they, in the, when they were proposing then something concrete, like should there be a kind of... Uh, a li um, rules that how and who were doing the decoding for the AI basics. So then afterwards, also the company could benefit that they at least have the knowledge if the person in charge were dead or disappeared. So, so do you have a concrete plans and then your opinion of this kind of uh, uh, open rule book that you can afterwards track that how it started and where, how was it done? Was it a good ethics followed? Because we cannot follow the uh, technical details, but the process. Thank you. Of course, an excellent and difficult question. Um, I have actually a list of like 10 already. Um, Mr. Um, Saliba is here, yes. <laughs> um, okay, Patricia, of course, have the floor until uh, I see. Yes, Dragos, thanks. Uh, Patricia Doya. Yes, and then I will. Grazie. Go to Tiemo, I will speak Italian, uh, Madam Messager, please. Thank you. Uh, sorry for this uh, delay. Um, well, I'd just like to uh, thank you for the um, commitment that you've shown. You've already been to ETRE and um, uh, you're placing a great deal of uh, importance on this tact. Uh, now, business is expecting regulation. I don't think we should be afraid. They might be afraid of too much uh, regulation, but they are expecting regulation in a number of different areas. And uh, one point that you've already touched on, on a number of times you've spoken, and I think it's vital, it's not so much um, ownership of data, but use of data. Now, if you're using the data, it assumes that you own it as well. Ricerca è diventato... And also... Um, Horizon, for example, is the, the open basis the right way to uh, do this? Perhaps it's the um, uh, best way to uh, use the data. Um, we talk about common goods and uh, propriety. And I think that Europe should be focusing on um, open access. And um, before the extension of the guidelines, Europe was talking about ethical principles. And when I was speaking to stakeholders, I saw a kind of uncertainty. Today, I think I've understood that stakeholders as well believe that the European approach is um, something that we all need to um, be involved in, and it can be a point um, of strength for us. And I was just wondering how you see that. Um, we are very much expecting good results from you. You can, Tiemu. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for being here again. You have been present during the exchange in the jury committee. So this really shows uh, how uh, committed you are to maintaining a good dialogue with the Parliament. And thank you very much for this. Um, of course, we are all waiting uh, for the Commission to pre present uh, the proposed measures on AI within the first 100 days. So we know that it will be a white paper. And I've Two questions, and I'll try to be as short as possible. Um, the Commission work program for 2020 states that we need to establish an ecosystem of trust. I totally agree to this uh, pro uh, approach. In that light, uh, we see that some member states are already moving forward. For example, in Germany, there is the... Um, Data Ethics Commission, and it already presented some recommendations. And Denmark is thinking about uh, to, or already about int to introduce a data ethics seal uh, with member states already looking uh, into their own measures and also implementing the many valuable recommendations coming from the scientific community. Uh, how will you ensure that a regulatory framework for, uh, for artificial intelligence that allows enough room for an ecosystem, but is still effective. This would be the first complex and the second one. Um, I understand that innovation is very important for data economy and the Internet of Things and Industry 
0.0 or whatever in Europe. However, uh, when we talk about trustworthy artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence, the implication is that our approach to AI must earn the trust of the European citizens. In my view, this is only possible if our regulatory framework for artificial intelligence is firmly rooted in the precautionary principle. Data protection is laid down in the GDPR and first and foremost safeguards fundamental rights. Um, that's a big challenge. So if you could uh, maybe shed some light on the question how you try to manage this balance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tedorac and then Mr. Christoph. Thank you. Um, dear Vice President, you know that I, I represent Renew, so uh, I don't think it's a secret that we've been working for uh, quite some time uh, to uh, come up with a common vision paper or position paper of the group on artificial intelligence. And we've done that trying and bringing together all the committees uh, which are dealing with various parts of artificial intelligence, and we believe that in, in that exercise itself lies and will lie uh, the, the strength of the position paper that, that will produce. In that exercise, we've been playing a lot and we've been trying to find the right balance between the interest of promoting growth and innovation, which is an objective that uh, we as a group uh, very much uh, believe in. And of course, the need to uh, strike the right balance uh, in safeguarding uh, rights, uh, privacy, and, and putting and developing this technology around our values. Um, so I would venture the question on where do you think that the cursor in that uh, between those two objectives would would lie? And the second question comes from various discussions and debates that I've attended over the last couple of weeks or months around uh, this topic. And the question coming from the industry um, about the sandbox: How would we create a sandbox where we would? encourage, allow, create the right framework for companies to actually uh, test in a safe environment from a regulatory point of view various ideas and solutions. Um, and at the same time, how do we ensure that we keep and promote uh, the talent that both the industry needs to actually grow uh, and develop this technology, but also on the public authority side, we would need also the same talent in order to be able to do our part in certifying and scrutinizing the development of this technology. So this issue of talent and skills is also something that we've been fighting with, and I would like to hear your views. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Christophe, and then I will take. Uh, merci, Eva, d'avoir organisé cet événement. Well, thank you, Eva, for having organised this event. Commissioner, what will the Commission's approach be with regard to the need to facilitate access to data would you go for a general revision of the GDPR in order to prevent uh, any problems taking place with regard to the development of AI? There have been concerns recently expressed with regard to the implementation of Article 5 of the regulation, which relates to the use of data. How will you be able to find the appropriate balance between creating a legislative framework that protects citizens and the need to preserve the competitiveness of European businesses. Now, moving on to ethical aspects, are you going to go for a sectoral approach which is stricter in areas such as health, for example? And just a final question, if I may, what's your position on the use of face recognition technologies? Thank you. <laughs> Very easy question. So let's have <laughs> the first answers and then uh, we'll see if we have more. Um, if I start from, uh, from the last question uh, first, on, on facial recognition and, and other technologies that will uh, use your uh, body features to identify you, I think we have to be very cautious uh, because if we're not, then there is a risk that sort of haphazardly deployment undermine uh, fundamental rights that are in our constitutions, that are in our treaty, like the freedom to assemble. Uh, to manifest uh, your opinions. Uh, I would never exclude that technology for identification based on bodily feature can be useful and safe, but I think it's important that we have sufficient time to make sure that we do that. And I think there is a special sort of category of technology that is sensitive 
because it is, it is technology that bears a risk of undermining the very fundamentals of what constitutes you as a city in a society. Uh, on the question of, of ethics, I think it's, for, for me, the first grid is sort of the risk-based one, because I think in every sector, you can find things that are absolutely harmless, or at least not very risky, and you can find things that are, will be crucial for well-being, uh, maybe even life or death issues. And I think no matter what sector it is, you would want to know that if it's a high-risk technology, then there is a framework that regulates it, and that, that there is um, governance and enforcement. And I'd rather have uh, sort of simple fundamental things with high-risk technology uh, and enforcement than to have a very elaborate frame that covers everything, everything, but no way of enforcing it, just to give you a sense of, of my priorities. Second, on the use of data, um, I would not enter into revising the GDPR. Uh, for me, the important thing is the full implementation. Uh, our data protection agencies are still in the process of learning and engaging, and they do that, uh, I think, every day. But I still think that we have a way to go for citizens to feel that they are in control. We basically got digital citizens' rights by the GDPR that you gave us, but it's good to have rights. If it's even better to be able to exercise it. So I think that is sort of first things first. But the other thing is that there is so much other data than personal data or data that is covered by the GDPR. Just imagine Internet of Things. It will be humongous piles of data that will be produced. There are business data, machine-generated data, all kinds of data that we're sitting on as we speak. I think a lot of businesses, they are uncertain. Oh, I'm always told that, that this is gold. But since it's gold, I don't want to share it. But if you don't share it, the value may be zero. So there is a lot of data that is not being used because people are scared and don't know how to deal with it. And here, I think in particular, we need to help small and medium-sized businesses to get the most of the data they have already in order to scale their business or to add new services to what they do already. Because you see amazing things. I just heard about a company who can basically um, uh, supervise uh, water management systems from you know, a rural uh, site uh, in a member state all over the planet because they're in control of their data. On, on the question uh, how to have the talent, that's a really tricky point. And that basically should move the question of education, reskilling, upskilling, lifelong learning into sort of hardcore politics. Very often it's something that we sort of add on. Oh yes, of course, education. Uh, but it is uh, a hardcore measure because if we don't have the skills, uh, well then we do not know how to manage and we're not attractive for other people having the skills that we need. Uh, that, of course, puts the, position, the Commission in a tricky position because we have all the ambition, but the member states have all the tools. So we have to figure out how to work with member states uh, in order for them to, to encourage citizens to uh, take the, the options available uh, to get the skills needed. And I think especially people in my generation would need to need, have a push in order to, to get to know more uh, and to get more ambitious as to how we can contribute also to the development uh, in these areas. The sandbox question is a very tricky one uh, because here you would want to create maybe development areas, but you would still need to, to check before you unleash, especially if you're in sort of more uh, risky technologies. And, um, and when you look at the cursor, uh, where to put it between growth, innovation and, uh, and rights and values, maybe it's important to, to be so ambitious that you want to achieve both and not see it as, as contradictions. Because I don't think that all innovation is good innovation. If some evil thing in a James Bond movie innovates on a very, very uh, dangerous uh, weapon or, or virus or what do I know, that is not good innovation. We all know that. We've seen that a thousand times. Uh, just to illustrate that there is innovation where we say, thank you, but no thank you. The kind of innovation we want is innovation that is built on a solid foundation of procedures and, um, and, and business culture that allows us not to have narrow innovation, we will have broad innovation, 
but where we feel comfortable that it's made in a proper way. And that uh, brings me to the question of, of trustworthiness as, as such and, and precautionary principles. And this is not new, uh, because in European democracies, we've been doing that for decades and decades and decades. Uh, I very often think about agriculture. A lot of farmers, they would be cautious in their use of pesticides. Uh, they would treat their animals well. But there will also be some, probably a small minority, who may not be cautious with pesticides, who may not treat their animals well. But since we do not want to take a chance on our drinking water and the welfare of animals, we make regulation for everyone. And then we say, now go compete, but not, you know, on the cost of our drinking water or the cost of animal welfare. So it's not a new thing that we in Europe say, well, of course, this is a democracy. Citizens have representatives who set the framework to make sure that we get everyone on board. And I think that is very important that we do not scare away to say that because it's about innovation and things are moving fast, that we should refrain from doing the fundamental that makes citizens see that we will actually have both. We will secure our fundamental values, but we'll also enable innovation uh, that is needed because on that I, I completely uh, agree. Um, to break, to, to allow for or enable uh, all the different things coming, coming through, uh, I think for, for business, it's important to have all the input and to try to create a European framework. Uh, it can be a, an excellent idea to have a data ethics seal. It can be an excellent idea to have procedures that enable con company culture to evolve, but it would be best to have it as a European perspective, because otherwise the fragmentation will make it uh, very, uh, very uh, difficult. Um, to get the stakeholders uh, on board, uh, well, that is, of course, uh, tricky, but there has been a tremendous change over the last five years. You know, I have business people coming to my office and say, you must regulate. Probably some, they align with what they think is unavoidable, um, but others, they also say, well, we better get this right, because they also sense that people lose trust in, in technology. And if I look at how uh, businesses engaged in piloting the seven ethical principles that the high-level uh, uh, ex expert group gave us. We got 350, you know, high-quality inputs as to how it was to work with these ethical principles. I see businesses putting in time, resources, their innovation processes in order to give us a feedback to see that it works. And that is new. And I think that shows that everyone realizes that we need to get, uh, get this right. And we cannot have a conflict between the legislator and the business community uh, and then the citizen being stuck uh, in between. Uh, last but not least, on the question of open rulebook uh, and the ethics. Uh, one of the things that I find very uh, inspiring is the research done now on explainability. Uh, that AI can explain itself uh, and that you can have AI to explain what other AI is doing. Uh, because I, I'm, I'm with you, I would not myself be able to understand how the algorithm would work in any level of detail and in particular when you get learning technology. So you have one starting point and then things happen and then you have an output. So there is a risk of black box. Uh, in that, of course, it is very important that we have explainability as part of our uh, set of rules so it doesn't depend on having the same coder in the same company in a lifelong um, uh, employment ship because that will not happen. Uh, that, of course, leads back to, to one thing, which is that a number of the products that we will be discussing, they're already covered by, you know, layers and layers of European legislation. But the thing is that when you would want to look at safety, liability, uh, what you have, it may be more difficult to exercise your rights because it's more difficult to see what went wrong when you have a technology that has learning uh, propositions. And this is why we'll also have to revisit part of existing legislation to make sure that it's actually uh, enforceable. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> I know, so I, I know they want to steal you. 
Yeah, well, but it's because the president has said we have to come, and you know, when the president says something, then you have to do it. <laughs> okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. Two de force, but then it has to be one question by <laughs> each of the five, because here we had one question yeah. very short. Yes. Give, so, a, give or take 20. I have Ismail Artuk, uh, Maria Marquez, and I have um, Damien Saliba. Very short. And the rest, we want to have a fire chat with OECD and SEPS yes. that they advise and they're uh, with us. And we're going to have a follow up event. So she's committed. So please, Ismail. Yes. Yes. Thank you for the time. And thank you, Commissioner, for joining us and staying a bit longer with us. The CEO of Google has recently stated that AI is more profound than fire or electricity, and we know that AI will represent an opportunity. But there are also some risks and challenges we need to address together, and one of them is the boost of inequalities, gender and stereotype-based inequalities, but also inequalities in the market. Do you think an independent European authority or watchdog ensuring monitoring gender bias or any other stereotyping in AI products can be an effective tool, or would you rather continue to let private platform self-regulate? And what are your views on data as a public good and sharing between public and private? One Thank question, you. Maria Marquez, <laughs> one sort. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very, very short without thank you. Um, what do you think about uh, open data policy we have encouraged in different countries and also in the European Union until now? Uh, if data are a valuable resource, do you need to reconsider open data policy? And what do you think about European common data spaces, namely in health? Thank you. Thank you, Timian. And then to ladies. So I understand that we need to um, produce more data and share more data, but I have a question on the norms and standards because of the data that is currently out there is hardly usable for algorithms at this point. So do you think we should ramp our, on, up our game on standards and norms for data structures? Thank you. Usted decía que necesitábamos um, para alcanzar esa. Well, you were saying that in order to achieve this excellence, what was needed was data as well as funding. Now, in Europe, we have significantly less funding than in China and the United States, but we do have Horizon Europe and Digital Europe. Do you think that that will be enough to ensure that we achieve this sovereignty? How can we make better use of these funds in order to bolster our talent? And we're going to have to invest in data infrastructure. What kind of thing can we do to improve that? I'm still behind you. If she's listening. No. So um, I would take your answers and your commitment you're coming back. Thank you. Uh, you're perfectly right to say that there's a higher risk of, uh, of bias. And that both comes from the fact that data sets themselves can be biased and there are things of which we have no data. And very often we forget that there are things that, are not, well, that we don't know sufficiently about. Uh, in many countries, we don't even have um, statistics of wages uh, that are uh, gender specific. So there's a lot to do to increase the data quality. And, and in that one way or another, uh, we will need to be able to enforce what we want to have. How to construct a, a watchdog, I, I don't know uh, today, but it is important to be able to enforce what you want to have. As said, I think it's better to have simple uh, but firm priorities and then to be able to enforce them than to have a very elaborate uh, filigran of, uh, of uh, priorities and not being able to, to enforce it. Uh, there's two questions of, of data as a public good. I think in, in, this, in the starting point, and, and maybe we've been here now for five, ten years, it has been a good solid policy to make data available in, in, in huge quantities to allow for businesses uh, to innovate. Uh, that goes for geo, uh, geo data on, on rivers and streams and heights and what have you, uh, on satellite data. But now, what we are creating now is basically the equivalent of new land. Or it is as to discover a mine of a new uh, uh, metal that we didn't have before. 
And if you imagine that kind of discovery, uh, would you then just say, well, first come, first serve? I don't think so. I think you would consider how to make sure that this resource is put to the best possible use for innovation, for business, but also for the citizens. In particular, if it's a citizen is in the role of a taxpayer who has been financing the creation of this uh, resource. Um, that doesn't mean that we should give up uh, on, on, um, on opening up on data, but it means that we should consider how to make sure that taxpayer-funded uh, data also have a sense of kickback to the same taxpayer. Uh, because if you, if you think about other resources, you would, you would not treat it as you treat data. And there is a thing in the market, if you access data as the first one and create a service on behalf of that data, if you're successful, then it is likely that you will own the market for this service. So the one that comes in as number two may be successful in creating a service, but may be not be successful in the marketplace because everyone has already locked in in that ecosystem. And this is why it's not sufficient just to say, but everyone can just reuse the data and do the same thing as the first comer because there's a market effect as to how these services are then being used. And this is why this for me is a very important debate to have now because there will be a step change in how much data will be created because of the reality of Internet of Things and the reality in more and more also governments being more digital and more and more services being delivered in a digital way, which is why many more data will be created. It's an excellent point uh, to say that we need norms and standards, in particular if we also want small and medium-sized businesses to be able to participate. Uh, you probably know that the Commission uh, have created sort of a special access to satellite data that in particular cater for small and medium-sized businesses to plug in and to use this data. And that is because they have standards and they know uh, how to deal with this. So, of course, you can now have technology that can find a needle in a haystack, but then you need that technology to find the needle in a haystack. And maybe if you want a more broad access, you need to have a ways of organizing data that is, that is more uh, accessible. Um, I think it's a good idea to have common data spaces. I think that will be very, very helpful, uh, and I think it can be contrasted. When it comes to funding, uh, Europe is excellent when it comes to producing uh, knowledge uh, and producing AI. 30% uh, of um, academic papers on AI, they're, they're European. In the business-to-business -business development of artificial intelligence, we have a lot to offer but we have way too little funding. And that is not just us as, as Europe, that is also us as member states. Member states do not invest sufficiently in artificial intelligence. Um, we, of course, hope that, that with um, uh, Horizon uh, Europe and with uh, Digital Europe and different uh, programs, that we can up this and that we also can attract more private uh, investment. Uh, so, you know, I really hope that the coming uh, weeks and months of negotiations about the next seven-year budget will realize that we have to invest in the future because no matter how much I, I don't want this to be a race, it is a race. And we have to be able to attract talent and to make the most of this technology. Uh, and that is not because of other geopolitical factors. It's because that otherwise we do not serve citizens well. So I think the future is in good hands because you combine knowledge and vision and leadership. And I think more than a race, it's, it could be actually a tech cold war that we have. So we have to discuss again. Thank you. Uh, the most influential MEPs on these agendas are here. So I think we have to continue the debate. Thank yes. you so much for being with us. And uh, we will continue the debate with Anthony and Thank you so much. I'll take the rest of the questions that you have for the speakers we have with us. Uh, we have actually the people that we work together in order to form new policies. Uh, Anthony Gooch, the Director of Public Affairs and Communications of OECD, but even more than that, I would say Anthony has been uh, influential since 
OECD is creating and has the ability to have global standards applied. Uh, we've seen that uh, he managed to do that several times with digital tax, tools, and uh, also blockchain, and now artificial intelligence. Um, so we will try to work together. And Andrea Renda from uh, SEPS, he's not just uh, a research fellow there and a professor of digital innovation, but actually um, a very important advisor to the work of the Commission and the Parliament. So I will keep taking questions that you have uh, for them to respond to, unless they want first to make a comment which would actually could be a good idea, what do you think? Yes, so Anthony, thank you for being with us. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Eva, for um, the invitation. Uh, we, I think it was uh, December of 2018 when uh, I was uh, last here for uh, an event. I see that it's even more popular uh, than it was uh, before, despite the 45 minute delay. As you can tell from my accent, um, I, uh, felt, I felt a special uh, emotion coming back here. I'll declare my interest. Half of me is British, half of me is Spanish. I worked for the European... I, exactly, I worked for the European Commission for 14 years. And uh, part of me had also, uh, uh, over the years, um, uh, managed the, uh, the assimilation of, of this process, which has been very difficult. But being back here today in that way uh, is, um, is, is indeed uh, complex and challenging. Equally, the wonderful thing is that being part of the OECD, uh, even if I were fully British, means that uh, I would be able to continue engaging on a very regular basis with you. Um, the, the first comment I want to make is a self-serving comment and it, uh, because I understand that we have some very influential members of your group who are here. Um, and it's the self-serving the self uh, comment is also for you. So the OECD has been active uh, on artificial intelligence uh, in the last uh, three or four years. And I think you will probably know a number of things that we have done. I'll be able to talk about some of those things. But I'm going to tell you um, or ask you uh, also to engage with us because we're at the start of something. Uh, being at the start of something means that we have to listen. Uh, that's the side of communication most people really struggle with. They're super at talking and they're really bad at actually listening. So we don't assume that we know everything. We don't assume that we know what the major concerns and aspirations everyone has out there uh, actually uh, are. How can we get a finger on the pulse of that? So uh, I joined the organization in 2008 global financial crisis and saw we had no connection with legislators, and yet we are a global public good. Our job is better policies for better lives. It's not just a slogan. Who does policies and who's connected with lives? You are. So we need the connection with legislators and parliamentarians uh, like we've never really needed it before. And I would say that our connection for you is very valuable uh, for you uh, as well. And this crystallizes around artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a general purpose technology. What that means is that it, it affects and impacts everything. It's like blockchain. And uh, Eva and I got to know each other over blockchain. And too many people think blockchain is all about currencies. They're not thinking about democratic systems or whatever it may be. On artificial intelligence, uh, we're also at, a, at very early stages. Perhaps people think this is just about driverless cars. So. Uh, we have to recognize uh, the, the, the point that we are at, whilst we may be in specialized domains, are starting to see many things emerging. And I wouldn't like to be in the shoes of uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Vestager. You clearly have a lot of trust in her. We talked about trust deficits. It seems, though, that she has a, a very high trust quotient. We, um, we are creating, we have created the first um, uh, group on artificial intelligence with a global representation of parliamentarians in the context of the OECD's Global Parliamentary Network. And we'll be meeting for the first time in Paris on the 26th of February. Eva knows this very well because she's one of the founder members. She's been in our network for many years. She started because she was very interested in tax issues, which, by the way, remains super interesting. And maybe we'll get a chance to comment those because they are very topical right now. Uh, digital tax issues, which I think you will all have heard of. And they're, they're linked also because the issues that we can, we can address, particularly resource issues, many of you have brought up the issue of resource. What is the resource available or lack of resource? Uh, 
securing an agreement on tax, including on digital tax, will be a virtuous circle because it will actually um, allow and open the possibilities to be able to uh, try and harness uh, those positive elements to uh, ferment on the one side and to uh, uh, protect on the, on the other. So there is an, an invitation that I make through you and this kind invitation uh, to uh, uh, members of parliament, staffers and interested parties uh, uh, here to uh, uh, join, join, join with us and engage on this. And, and I'm sure that we will also be organising meetings of the, this group here in, the, uh, here in the parliament in future. Thank you, Anthony. Andrea Reda, we have EU40 also here. So as a professor, we have a lot of young people, to people attending. Uh, uh, they would definitely like to hear your um, point of view here and in the future. And I will talk about what we're planning to do in the future together, but I want to listen to you and then take questions for you. All right, thank you, Eva. Thanks for having me. Um, it's very interesting to hear uh, uh, the Executive Vice President Vestager um, and the, apparently the vision she has uh, is inspiring for, for all of us. It's based on a number of very big bets as well. But at the same time, I think there is an element of substance behind that. Uh, I think it's very difficult to make comparisons in terms of how much are we investing in this or that other sector. It's very difficult also to earmark funds for artificial intelligence, exactly because of what Anthony was saying before. Artificial intelligence is pervasive in nature, uh, which means in every sector, in every aspect of the future uh, uh, policy initiatives that you will adopt and the spending decisions that you will adopt, there will be an element of artificial intelligence. And there is one elephant in the room here that I want to flag immediately. Um, Margrethe Vestager is, a, is a, a vice president in a commission that is declared to be uh, a geopolitical commission presented itself as a geopolitical commission and has invested uh, a big part of its initial political capital in the Green Deal, right? in the European Green Deal. We are talking about resources that are hard to imagine. We are talking about something that from the commission itself, I've heard, quantified at something like 450 billion euros per year over the coming decade. Okay? Now, this is, one might think these resources are going away from artificial intelligence, right? But indeed, um, the two transitions, the green transition and the digital transition, are intertwined. And the two transitions have to be seen as such. Artificial intelligence is fancy, is cool, uh, is risky, is scary, is whatever you want it to be, uh, because it's pervasive. But certainly not all types of artificial intelligence are as useful or as, uh, say, highly deserving of your attention as MEPs or stakeholders as, uh, you know, when, when you look at the various use cases and applications. Um, to me, I've had that experience already in the early days uh, of uh, the high-level expert group on AI of the European Commission, when the Commission itself gave me and other 51 uh, experts the mandate of writing the ethics guidelines, but at the same time to work on the EU competitiveness. Uh, I really don't see why this should be our focus. Okay? Um, I don't think Europe should treat AI as an end. AI is a means. And we can use AI to develop the new fancy way of doing a selfie that makes, it, makes us more handsome, or, you know. We can use, uh, invest resources on AI for military applications. We can invest our resources on AI for the better recommendation engine. That's not gonna lead us anywhere uh, near our sustainability objectives, and in particular, the environmental transition. If we place our money, even on the Green Deal, it might be even more useful than placing it on a fund dedicated to AI, if it's AI without directionality, if it's AI without purpose. And that is extremely important for us now that we are reflecting on what to do with this fantastic beast that we need to tame. And indeed, here comes my next comment. It's often said that speed is nothing without control, right? And speed is what we see in AI development today. I don't want to sound retro because in principle I'm normally I'm, I'm not, Eva knows that. Uh, but if you look at the model of society that the US and China are offering us with the development of AI without limits and without constraints, what we see there is not sustainable. It is a lot of money that is flowing into those economies. 
But we are seeing not only social credit scoring, you know, the obvious things that we see in China, but we're seeing private surveillance in the United States, uh, blossoming inequality, uh, the end of the uh, really uh, the, the attractiveness of the Silicon Valley model. We're discovering that, as uh, Vice President Festager was saying, not all innovation is equal, and we need that innovation that leads us close to the frontier that we have given ourselves uh, for 2030 and beyond. So let's stop talking about AI. We are behind. We lost the data train. We, we, are, uh, we are not going to make it. I think there is a chance that this time we actually might be getting it right, or we have a chance to get it right which requires all the institutions, the EU institutions, the stakeholders, the experts to try and find the balance of having the right speed with the, with the, right, uh, with the right control. And where does this lead the regulatory dimension? Um, I think we shouldn't be scared of regulation uh, in this case. Um, the academics literature, as an academic, this is what I bring to, the, to this forum, is quite clear, I think, in uh, uh, demonstrating the complementarity and the compatibility of good regulation with innovation. Indeed, regulation gives direction to innovation. And if we time it right, if we design it with the right stringency, uh, not excessive, but also not to lose, um, if we design it in a way that is proportionate and flexible, if we design it in a way that is principles-based, and only Europe can do that, because our principles are much more solid and well rooted in our treaties and in our understanding of fundamental rights than many other areas of the world. If we make it outcome-based at the same time, we know where we want to go. If we put all this thing together in our cocktail of future regulation, we will have a, a very good regulatory framework that will not stop the type of AI developments that we don't want to see, and we'll actually encourage and channel AI investments in the directions that we need. And I think this is what, um, in, uh, as a member of the high-level expert group on AI, as an academic, as a think tanker, as a citizen, I will want to fight for in the months to come. We don't, you know, nobody has a, has a final recipe, right? So I'm here, just one like you. Uh, I've been given some responsibilities, not just as uh, big as the ones that you in the parliament or the vice president or even Anthony has. But for what I can, uh, can do in terms of a contribution, I will do whatever I can to make sure that policymakers understand that the data train has not left the station, that we should seek a good combination of speed and control, and that we should make sure that we build the European model to AI in a way that speaks to the rest of the world and shows what could be a balanced approach between man and machine and between the planet and machine compared to what we've seen so far. Thank you. Both. Um, so uh, we, keep, we keep having more and more and influential MEPs joining this debate. Um, let me say that for me this is the beginning and for us, uh, for a Centre for Artificial Intelligence under STOA, to be able for the first time maybe to coordinate, to try to set global good standards for the digital era. So um, OECD, IEEE, um, Andrea from the Commission, United Nations, these are the big players we will try to have here because 2020 is going to be the year we should definitely set or attempt to set global standards um, to make these disruptive technologies uh, to be for good and join forces. Um, and I see Mr. Eller, Vice President McGuinness, uh, being with us. It's a great honor because, as I said, it's a historical day and not an easy day, uh, but maybe it's important to start discussing the future. And if uh, and whoever wants to take the floor from my colleagues first, um, please, yes, you for sure, and then. Yeah, uh, thank you for being here and uh, for this introduction. Well, uh, as you probably know, uh, there is a draft uh, white paper available somewhere. And um, of course, yeah, somewhere, let's say, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it's, to my opinion, quite good in a sense that it really shows the landscape, probably that without proposing uh, really well concrete regulatory decisions, but nevertheless, it deals with options. And these options are basically three. The first one is a voluntary labeling uh, option. Uh, the second one is sectoral requirements and the, with a big emphasis on the facial recognition. And the third one is uh, 
to identify the high risk uh, areas and to deal primarily with them. As far as I understand, the Commission right now is, well, mostly focusing or preferring the third option. If it was your decision, what would be your approach to these options proposed? <laughs> Thank you. I will take um, our second and first Vice President of STOA questions, and then I will give you the floor. Christian Eller. Um, might be that due to my German nature of a fairly practical approach. I mean, we are in practical terms now negotiating the budget in the end of the year. Um, there are two resources for funding, at least for public funding of the EU. One is the part in the framework program where we have roughly 15 billion euro for space and digital in overall. And then we have the second pot, the 16 billion um, from the Connect program. <clears throat> there, the allocation process is done, more or less is 2.5 for artificial intelligence. Um, the rest, which is supposed to come out of the framework program. I mean, there might be resources from EIB, but that is then loans or something else. So now we are going public, um, pretty much saying um, we want to spend 1.5 billion a year on AI. So simple math that doesn't need AI tells you that if you have 2.5 billion in the connect, um, it should be 8 billion coming out of digital. If you see the proportionality between space and digital um, in that challenge in the framework program, roughly 4 billion to 5 billion will go to space. That had been historically the proportion. Then we have 10 billion left. That would mean that we would allocate practically 90% of that challenge for AI. And my simple question is, first of all, I mean, how do you see that in proportionality? We are out, we want to have a, fun, um, a Fed flagship mm -hmm. on quantum, which is now postponed. We want to do supercomputing. We do want to do a, a range of, of issues. So where do you see the proportionality in terms of ambition? Because I'm, I'm a little bit worried the Commission getting out, announcing 10.5 billion or 11. And in real terms, I mean, it's not even set with the Council that we get the, the money. I mean, there is a big dispute on the on the budget. So how do you see the proportionality between the importance of AI and the other ambitions on quantum and so on, so fairly close related to AI in, 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 in many ways? And then I have an, a last question. Um, Mr. Vestager was referring to the importance of data, so that data produced by public money should be seen as something very substantial because, I mean, we are looking to data, uh, to AIs and algorithms, but data is the source of wisdom, so to say. But interestingly, I mean, other than Mrs. Vestager was recently announcing that we should be very careful and the data shouldn't just be spread, I mean, the general policy in the program had been open, open, open. So we want to go in the complete other direction and we predict that the broader society is now taking this data and using it for the benefit of the, the broader society. Whereas we would know that predominantly the data was sucked up by Google and the other big ones because we are publishing practically for free and so on. So, so do you see a certain contradiction between this open, 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 let's say, ideology and on the other hand, Mrs. Vestager is saying that's a resource and we paid for that and we should be carefully looking to who is going to get our data up, uh, funded by 120 billion, um, for example, of a research program. Thank you. Uh, Vice President McGuinness, would you have a question for us? Well, thank you very much um, and apologies that I came late. It has been a difficult day. Uh, my question it will not be an intelligent one because I don't know this area, but it's, it's a regulatory one. And sometimes in this uh, union, we, when we're putting regulators in place and, and people come from industry, we're suspicious of people coming from industry. I'm not. I think we need that crossover. How will we regulate and have this sufficient expertise if industry can pay much more? And have you any guidance for us on this? Because to me, this is a critical issue. We need people who are on the, literally working on this, that, that, you know, that have that brain power, the skills, and we need those to be the regulators. Can we 
do that effectively? Will we be able to pay for it? And perhaps a question to ourselves is, do we understand that you're not evil if you once worked in industry and then become a regulator? Because on many other areas, this tends to be the perception. Thank you. And finally, Ms. Donato, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, my question is just a, a very common concern, I think, because uh, as a woman of the street, <laughs> I, I think that uh, a lot of people wonder, have, uh, are, have concerns that uh, uh, involve the, the aspect of ethics. Well, I heard you, uh, you are dealing with this, uh, and of course, this is, uh, this is one of the most important issues in uh, AI, the ethic uh, guidelines. But my, my concern is that uh, um, if uh, we, we, we know that in all countries, uh, in different countries, there are different ethical standards. So in a world that is hyper-connected, where there won't be the possibility of uh, putting borders on this uh, technology, uh, this the digitalization, and on the spread of this AI mechanisms in all processes where decisions uh, will be made. How can we find a way to control the effects of other uh, ethical standards uh, based decisions taken by devices. And, and the, second, the second question is also, um, is there, I, I heard that there is the, the serious possibility that AI um, drives into um, self-conscious devices. And in that case, how can we think that a self-conscious self device want to uh, one day think that human beings are useless and probably uh, an, you know, a problem for development of the world and whatever. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, and if I may add, I would like also to ask, um, since we, uh, we had GDPR, I think it, would be a, it was a very strong initiative to protect privacy. Should we consider, because I heard Ms. Uh, uh, Vice President um, Vestager saying that we don't want to change GDPR, but do we want to, inf to enforce it or to strengthen it? Because the opt-out choice actually doesn't create awareness. Maybe we should think of an obligation or incentives to opt in and protect by default our basic sensitive data so uh, and and give more options so my mic to be my microphone and my camera to be off when i'm not using it because it's on i don't have the choice to shut it down unless i shut down my uh, device and even even so we don't know um so should we have obligation to make sure that citizens are aware that their data are being collected so not just for the uses and then the question would be because at the white paper that everybody has, <laughs> actually, um, I'm not sure if it's, um, it, it, I know it's like the best thing is to say it's a secret and everybody knows about it. So it says per sector. Do you think the high risk is per sector or per use? Because this is very important and a thin line and balance to keep. So um, I'll give first the floor to Anthony and then Andrea. I would rather you inverted it um, because I don't have the white paper. I may be the only, oh. I may be the only person in the room. Um, uh, so maybe, uh, but I'll be, I'll, there's a couple of questions I'm, I'll be happy to come back on, but we'll, okay. if you don't mind. You're not in this bubble, that's why. All right, so yeah, of course I have the white paper. Uh, I confess, uh, I'm guilty. I have, to, I have downloaded it and read it. And uh, the Commission already indicates which, which options at the very, very end of the leaked white paper, which options are, uh, the Commission considers to be more viable. Uh, I wish I could say this is an open process because for now there has to be an impact assessment, there has to be a comparative analysis of an alternative uh, set of policy options, um, which is the normal procedure if you go from a white paper then to a legislative initiative. Uh, but I think we've heard enough in terms of the political direction in which this is going, but also in terms of the academic and scientific reflection in which this is going that would warrant 
something more than self-regulation at this stage. Okay, um, so the first option. Um, the idea of a certification system appears to be complicated at this stage, uh, but it might be something that develops in a complementary way to a framework piece of legislation that will be proposed that at least carves in stone the key principles, the key ethical principles, and the corresponding legal provisions, because there's a lot of that ethics in, is indeed already law. Uh, and that is something that um, uh, would require inadequate governance to go into the, the, the question on, on the regulators. Um, there is um, a peculiarity in this market, uh, which is not that it is self-conscious or that there is artificial general intelligence. I'll get back to this in a second. But the peculiarity is, again, the speed. Uh, we cannot rely on uh, legislators to be prescriptive in command and control. We cannot rely on sanitization bodies to be able to follow the pace at which this technology is developing. There needs to be something, someone, either a network of national regulators or is something more, let's say, um, consistent and, uh, and important at the, at the center that uh, spreads regulatory certainty in the market. Basically, the way in which this legal system is evolving is a risk-based assessment, is risk-based system in which we are attributing to the people that develop, deploy, and use AI the responsibility before they introduce AI in the market to assess the risk that they are generating and in a proportionate way to adopt uh, mitigating measures in a way that is as transparent as possible. Now, what are those risks? Um, and whether those risks are the same today than they will be in two weeks? This is something that uh, requires constant attention. The ones that develop these products on the market, we will need, they will need to have as much as possible a constant update of what are the good practices in the market that are considered to be relatively safe from the perspective of risk mitigation. And this, in my opinion, requires an, a, an enhanced govern, governance mechanism. Some, it could be in the form of a similar to the Data Ethics Commission. It could be in the form of, a, of a something mm, that builds on top of a data protection board. You, you will probably have to decide that, uh, but I think this is not a system that develops by itself with simple legislation and courts. Uh, this is uh, for sure. And um, on the open data, uh, well, I actually have the question on the, on the budget. Again, I, I'm not saying that I'm particularly happy with the endowment and the, and the uh, funds earmarked so far for, for AI. But my question is, how much of these funds for space will be about using AI? Um, it is possible that I would actually expect that most of the industrial policy of the future, most of the, of the places where you will develop, even in Horizon Europe, the partnerships and the missions, the, the AI component will be heavy. Think about the mission on smart cities, the mission on agriculture, the mission on cancer. All these are AI intensive missions. So I'm not saying that I'm happy. I'm saying make sure that AI and related technologies such as the Internet of Things, that in my opinion, in two years, we'll be talking about that more than AI in this same room, maybe, um, the, that those become a sort of soft conditionality on the way money will be spent, that cutting edge technologies are the way in which those big uh, sectoral plans to, to, to devote funding are, um, are deployed and are designed and that uh, the, the governance of the missions and the partnerships, which are the bulk, if you wish, of Horizon Europe, uh, will contain experts uh, and the scientific component that deals with AI, and that will be able to implement those technologies for the missions and the partnerships, which are much more nested in sustainable development goals. I mean, Horizon Europe is basically on page one, the proposal is mentions the sustainable development goals, and then throughout. Now, I understand this has been reoriented even more towards the Green Deal, okay? Because that's the new mantra in the Commission, whatever. The missions and the partnerships are purpose-driven, are mission-oriented. And uh, those missions have to be pursued through enhanced use of the best technologies that we have. So whether we have an individual fund for AI only, that's a little bit of a ghetto fund, if you wish, for maybe, I hope, basic research and industry implementation. But I think there is a lot more in the 100 plus, hopefully, hopefully billions of Horizon Europe that will be about AI and related technologies. That's at least what I hope. Um, more quickly, because otherwise I want to leave space for Anthony, of course, the open data. I think I dare to say, since I'm a free thinker, I can, uh, you know, I don't have, I have more liberty than, than most people in the room. Uh, I have the sense that the open at all costs season is over. Okay. Um, 
we've had a commission for research that were preach was preaching open science, open innovation, open to the world, more ecumenical than the Dalai Lama or, or any other spiritual guru. We've had that, and it was a different season. Today, we see that data has a, has a spe specific feature. Some data, especially the ones that are produced with public money, have to be left open for researchers in particular to use them. There's no need to transform this into a data monopoly. Indeed, interoper mandatory interoperability of those types of data is one of the key avenues for future policy options. But there's also data that maximizes its value when it's kept, shared, but not open. And there's actually data, as you see from the patent system, that actually has the highest value if it remains confidential for a while. Okay? This is the economics of information. It's different from simply saying, the more it's open, the better it is. We are discovering that now. We've been a little bit mesmerized by two decades of internet, uh, of, the, of the openness at all costs. I think it's time to come back to reality. And the industrial policy strategy of the European Commission will mostly be about sharing data. But that is also important for another reason that sharing data and keeping data as much as possible uh, uh, close to where the value is being created, uh, it's a way to safeguard our industrial players and the users from the centripetal forces that always bring the data up there in the platforms. And so we have an additional reason for this, uh, which is a reason of balancing. It's a reason of sustainability, if you wish, economic and social sustainability in particular, because it, the economy, in particular in Europe, but anywhere in the world, cannot progress in a balanced way if the ones that are supposed to be creating the value are not the ones that profit or that extract that value. That is extremely important. Um, so, I, of course, I can... Uh, I, I could go on, as you, as, you, as you imagine, forever, but that wouldn't be fair. Um, the um, ethics uh, part and the, and, and the GDPR uh, parts, uh, in, my, in my opinion, the GDPR has a key component that is a blueprint for our future initiatives, which is its extraterritoriality. Okay? Uh, with the GDPR, maybe we made some mistakes, maybe it could be fixed. Uh, maybe it could be adapted to the AI era, for sure, but the GDPR has a very important part that makes it a, a, an example for the rest of the world and a good starting point for us, which is the GDPR leverages our single market and tells anybody who wants to deal with the European consumers that they have to be compliant with those rules anywhere they are located. If they want to deal with the single market, they have to be compliant with those rules. And I think I would expect that some elements of this will flow into our attempt to raise the bar on responsible AI. It has to be like this. Maybe it will be less procedurally heavy. Uh, maybe, maybe it will be a bit more flexible and adaptive. But the future system will draw lessons from, from the GDPR age. And maybe the, the GDPR 2.0 will also be uh, still extraterritorial, but I think a bit more flexible and adaptive, but still putting forward the principles that we want to um, uh, enforce and endorse. Uh, finally, uh, the self-consciousness. I am originally an economist, the least useful profession in the world, uh, especially when you talk about AI. I have been working about, you know, on technology for many years and policy, uh, but I rely on experts, okay, when I need to know things that are so delicate. So I've, I've been asking many experts this question about the sentience or the singularity or the self-consciousness. The message that I gather, if I had to summarize in one statement, is the difference between the one that, that wait for the singularity and the ones that work on narrow artificial intelligence is the same difference that exists between astrology and astronomy. <laughs> okay, so that was very interesting, Andrea. And actually you touched indeed of, of a subject that is not very easy to say. In Europe, we talk about open innovation, and now we have to make sure that we will have reciprocity. And China is trying to localize the internet and keep secure data and not open their data. So we have to see how we're going to have sovereignty and protect without protectionism, and that's a big challenge. So, Anthony. Well, um, I'm going to pick up on, uh, on a couple of the questions that were, were posed and also uh, some of the points that Andrea made very thought-provoking. It's very difficult to follow someone who's just uh, come up with uh, that uh, parallel between astrology and, uh, and astronomy. Um, but let me uh, maybe take on the question of... Uh, uh, I think it was uh, Vice President McGuinness who, uh, who, who posed it, and it's a really interesting and good question, because, of course, we are used to uh, a world where 
uh, regulators uh, are uh, put in a position where they are being um, made representations to, otherwise known as lobbying, by, by many actors. And uh, the, um, the need to, to be um, circumspect is a, is a very natural and, and logical one. And yet we are in a situation where we have seen an unprecedented uh, change in situation where you have actors who have essentially developed global public goods originating in the back of their garage in California, say. Um, now, in a situation like that where you have a, um, a de facto uh, number of cases of this type, you can't uh, uh, wish that away. When I say that you can't wish that away, you can't wish that away if you're the guy who originally had the back of the garage and who now is perhaps sitting with the cares of the world on his shoulders, and that wasn't really the plan, but he can't get away from it. Uh, and it's also a situation if you are charged with that responsibility of regulating in the classic sense, you know, the European Commission, for example, or indeed sitting here in the European Parliament with the responsibilities that you have. So what does that, um, what does that mean? I would posit that it means that those who are involved in the private sector business, it's not the world as it was before. They do have the cares of the world on their shoulders. Whether you buy into uh, the transformations that are taking place in the business community, business roundtable, purpose over profit, etc., think of it in a way which is, what is in the vested interest, probably, of both sides? If you are sitting in that situation where you have the cares and pressures of the world on your side, nominally on one, on one side of the aisle, say, the private side of the aisle, or the other, you, you have actually a confluence of interests. We now know that there are regulatory teams that exist within the major global platform players. I haven't delved excessively into this. Maybe Andrea knows a little bit more. Maybe you know a little bit more. But I wonder, it, this isn't people who are lobbying. This isn't people who are, you know, setting up shop here in Brussels or in Washington and they're going to come and see you. And It's people who are actually getting their heads around the complexity of the issues that we are addressing uh, here. They do have that resource. They're sitting on that resource. They're sitting on that pressure. The pressure may even be being more strongly felt by them than it is by the classic regulatory spaces. Because who's in the firing line right now? I don't think that the European Commission it's ever been in the firing line in terms of saying, hurry up and regulate. Actually, it's the world upside down. Because normally the Commission was told, whatever you do, just get out of things. Don't, don't, be, don't be too, uh, too quick mm -hmm. on things. And actually, the irony, and I think uh, 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 Commissioner Vesta, you mentioned it, it's that business itself is a demandeur for regulation in a way that, again, is probably uh, unprecedented. What that leads me to think is that we have a natural alliance between uh, those who both have an interest in actually getting this right. Now, I'm not being starry-eyed, but the actors we're talking about are really big actors. There's a lot at stake. I do not think that they have any interest in getting this wrong. I do not think that their reputations would ever recover, uh, etc. There's too much riding on it. And, uh, and so uh, uh, what, what this puts us in a, in a strange situation because I do think it means that there needs to be a sort of realignment. What does it mean for you as legislators when, when you are indeed approached by uh, those, uh, those platforms? I'm, Andrea, I was reading your bio earlier. You have a Google chair, you know. But we're listening to Andre. We don't think, oh, God, you know, Andre is saying this because he's got the Google chair, etc. So we're, we're in a position where it's multi-stakeholder, 
because the stakeholders haven't got i don't think the stakeholders have got much uh, uh, much, much choice in this uh, so i i think that certainly this is a a real um, a, a game changer but i think it's one where resource issues and i and i heard uh, um, uh, mr elder mention this question you were talking about uh, the, 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 the financial resources that are available at a European level. They're not unimportant equally. They may, they may not be quite what one would like. What are the resources that are available in other spaces that could actually come together in the public good? I think it's a thing that needs to be uh, pondered and worked through, but with an open mind, not with a, well, a, oh, of course, that is, that is going to be uh, for nefarious uh, purposes and activities. There are all sorts of vehicles that can be uh, identified to actually place resources in trusts that are uh, independently managed so that you can avoid the type of conflict of interest element that uh, uh, you might suspect would, uh, would emerge. So I, I would say that uh, this is a really interesting situation that we're in. We've not really been in it before. Um, it's going to require open minds on all sides, but certainly the, the level of engagement we have had with a number of these uh, actors and they are all over the OECD like a rash in the good sense of the word, they see the OECD as, um, as, a, as a central part to the solution. Now, why? I don't say that just because I work for the OECD or, you know, plug the OECD. What does the OECD offer that the EU can't offer? The OECD is global. And Eva said global standards. If the EU develops standards, it cannot assume that they are inherently global. They aren't. They're EU standards. That's very reasonable. Already to get to an EU standard, chapeau. But let's think about it in a, in a different way. Let's say we have uh, a world leader in standard setting, a part of the world that's very good at doing this. It's been doing it for a while. It has more practice at it. It has more institutions that do it. It has more processes that do it. And of course, I'm talking about the EU. It's been at this game for over 50 years. We have a unique example, and I've worked for the EU and developing standards, but also interacting with the rest of the world with our standards and how did you reconcile or how did you um, manage com conflict and, and, and friction. So the game changer here is GDPR. It's the first time that we see a standard emerge, took a considerable amount of time. It's got everything not going for it. It's an acronym that nobody understands. It's done in Brussels. It's done by the EU. All of the recipes for the people who are now leaving the building for the last time maybe a benefit to say, God, that's those awful people in Brussels up to no good again. And yet what happens? It de facto becomes a global standard. Now, I, I would disagree with Andrea, or at least maybe the manner in which you said it, it's, oh, it's because of the power of the single market. Ah, come on, the power of the single market is, is already there. I, I did trade negotiations for years. Didn't stop the Americans fronting up, and it doesn't stop trade sanctions and, and the rest. It's... Actually, I think it's the merit of having got the timing right, delivered within a time frame, and suddenly being out there with something that everybody needs, and they don't have any time. The Americans don't have any time all of a sudden. Others don't have any time all of a sudden. And they're saying, you know what? The pressure, the public pressure on us is enormous. Let's grab this thing. It's been worked through by this lot for years. My God. If 28 can agree to this thing, it can't be that bad, really. Let's think about it. OK, then extrapolate from that. Take the element that I was saying about, OK, this is an example where you have a comparative advantage. Maybe you don't enjoy that comparative advantage in technology in the same way. And maybe you can leverage these things when you're looking at uh, how uh, you can work together more effectively uh, over, over time. And you can see a situation where something that is pioneered at a European level can indeed serve a global purpose. 
That is where I would humbly say the OECD can be unbelievably helpful because the world trusts us. The world. The Japanese trust us. The Koreans trust us. The Australians trust us. The New Zealanders trust us. The Americans trust us. The Canadians trust us. The Mexicans, the Chileans, the Israelis. I can go on. It's always good to know that even here, no, I know here, we have 22 out of 37 member countries of OECD. But we're working with, you know, on digital tax. We've got 140 countries who are working with us to avoid global tax war and hopefully have peace and love at the end of it and be able to deliver the, the tax uh, revenues that will make uh, Mr. Eller's life a little bit easier in terms of, God, I've only got this amount of money to, to work with and what am I going to do for quantum and, and, and everything else? Um, that, that is something that I think that there's a real space there, both for, mm -hmm. for, for, for the EU work and that connection that you have with the OECD, which is an excellent one, uh, Ever, Stoa, more broadly, and, and I've been here with a series of meetings today, because what we're able to do is we're able to take things that are good, that have been done well, that reflect our principles, which are very close to the principles that were developed by the group that uh, Andrea was part of. The difference is our ones are bought into by the OECD countries. Oh, that includes America and Canada and all that list of people. And then the G20 endorsed them. Oh, China. Oh, it's becoming extremely interesting at that point. So I leave those two thoughts with you because I think that they're very, they're very valuable in terms of how we project forward and how Europe views uh, the role that it plays. But do not fall into the trap of looking at the European belly button constantly and all of the time, because actually this is going to have to serve a higher good than that at a certain point in time, unless you would like a world of fragmentation when you're very comfortable with Wendy Carter's four internets on steroids and where we're actually going to have a balkanization and a fragmentation of the world, that's a vision that uh, sits uncomfortably with me. Thank you. The interpretation can stop. Thank you so much for staying a bit more with us. Exactly that's why you're here, because we try to set um, global standards and the way you put it to serve a global purpose could actually be the key to success, a uh, successful setting of uh, global standards. Um, I don't know if you would like to have... No, I think it's a bit late. We were just 20 minutes late there, not 45. Um, just to set things right, everything will be uh, online. It's web-streamed. So I think we have a very good basis to, to start working on law and regulation to get it right. And this will be an ongoing effort for the next uh, at least year to come. Um, and hopefully we can, uh, we can get it right and it can be respected by UK, by US and uh, by more countries, more than you mentioned, because we see that it's also a, a discussion among democracies and people that respect mm -hmm. fundamental human rights and individual rights. You cannot set global standards if a government doesn't want to respect your right to have insurance or your right to public transportation because they have social ranking. So I think we can make sure that we will um, set the standards there and see who our allies could be and take it from there. Um, so I think they were the best concluding, rem concluding remarks, the ones you made. Astrology or astronomy, I think we have to get the science right. And I want to thank you all. This is just the beginning of the Center for Artificial Intelligence of STOA. STOA Secretariat and the scientists we have have uh, managed to, to set up an amazingly successful event with the most influential, again, colleagues. And we are starting uh, following, actually, the work you did, Michal Kritikos, for example, for the uh, algorithms and uh, GDPR. And we are going to have an impact assessment for artificial intelligence and any emerging technology and a risk assessment. So I think this is important because if you have the data and you understand what could go wrong, you will try to find the tools to avoid that. I want to thank you all for staying late. I think it's a symbolic day, an event today, the day that the Brexit was voted for to happen, although we strongly had in our hearts that it wouldn't, respecting their decision. 
but at the same time feeling a bit smaller in this European Union, but stronger that we can work together to achieve uh, better things for citizens and to win the good fights. I want to thank you um, all. Have a good night. Thank you.